Good evening, everyone. I'm Bruce Wingus, president of the Photo Society, and welcome to our presentation this evening by Roger Hill. Uh, we're going to find out how the man managed to stay ahead of tornadoes and everything else. So this promises to be a good show. A couple of announcements I've got to make. Um, if you missed our January program or any of the other ones, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. Just search for us on YouTube. Also, we're in the process of taking submission guidelines for the 2023 Cuyahoga Valley calendar. Um, that went out to all members as far as the guidelines and an email, and it's also on our website and Facebook page. The deadline is March 8th for those submissions. We're working on some other programs here. Photo Walk is just ending, and we're about ready to start another one here in the spring when the snow melts. Um, one other announcement that we're excited about is that we're planning an online workshop via Zoom for Saturday and Sunday, March 26, 27. It'll focus on seeing in black and white and guiding you through the post-processing workflow using Silver FX Pro to create uh, consistent, beautiful black and white images. Doug Johnson, a professional landscape photographer and educated based in educator based in Montana, uh, will be leading that workshop. We're working out the details now. We should get that done fairly soon, and we'll get that out to all you members. Um, final note here, if you're not a member of the Cuyahoga Valley Society, why not? Um, go ahead and join the Photo Society. You can do that through the Conservancy, and you can get into um, programs such as these, uh, get more information, and get a discount on the workshops that we do. So on that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Ash, our uh, pre programming uh, guru, and he's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So again, welcome and enjoy the program. Thank you, Bruce. Well, as we approach what I think is the largest severe storm season for most United States, and I'm sure. Mr. Hill will correct me if I'm wrong about that. It's possible I am. I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Roger Hill as our guest. Roger's been chasing storms for over 35 years, and he's got the photos to prove it. He's the Guinness Book World Record holder for witnessing the most tornadoes, any human, over 900 to date. Roger's been featured on nearly every TV channel on over 50 special programs from NOVA to National Geographic to Travel Channel to Discovery and of course, the Weather Channel. Um, his previous book is called Hunting Nature's Fury. And he has another book coming out soon, which is co-authored with his wife, called Chasing Storms, A Photographic Journey. This photograph has been featured in numerous magazines, calendars, and textbooks. Um, one particularly interesting article he wrote for Outdoor Photographer was about how to photograph storms. I think we're gonna get the live version of that tonight. Um, he grew up in a military family, ended up in the Topeka, Kansas area, where he saw, I'm sure, a number of storms. I'm uh, told that he saw Dorothy get sucked up to the land of Oz somewhere in Kansas, and that probably sparked his interest. Roger um, is today the co-owner of Silver Lining Tours. This is the nation's largest storm chasing tour company. So for those of you that want a more exhilarating experience than just watching the storms uh, on a camera or tube or um, you know through your channels you know how to do so now you can find him on rogerhillphotography.com and you can follow him on twitter instagram or facebook um, roger does all types of other photography slot canyons landscapes etc and I understand he's quite a bowler as well so please join me in giving a warm cuyahoga valley welcome to roger hill roger it's all yours Hey, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the invite and being able to be a part of your of your group tonight. Uh, nice, beautiful, sunny, warm day in Denver. I see your your, your snow on, on your background shots there. Yeah, it's, it was about 65 degrees and sunshine today, but uh, lo and behold, uh, the weather gods are going to give us about uh, eight inches of snow tomorrow night, so that, that'll be a nice change. We, we need all the moisture we can get. Uh, I, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, which I'd like to, uh, to fire up here and figure out some way to share it. <laughs> Let's see, what we, can we do here? Okay. There we go. Can you all see that? You can, okay. Uh, all right, yeah, you have some, for some reason you all are muted now, and I'm not sure why. Uh, but 
Okay, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start. Let me go back to that first picture there. Uh, yeah, say thank you again for for inviting me to to be a part of it. Uh, weather is just an amazing thing to photograph, and there's nothing like the plain states of the United States uh, to give you some some amazing photographic opportunities. Uh, this particular shot that you see on 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 my my cover photo here. Uh, it was actually a supercell thunderstorm that occurred near Lubbock, Texas last May. And uh, the neat thing about this, if you look at the structure of the storm right in the middle of the picture, uh, it kind of has that spiraling look to it, which shows that it was rotating and it actually produced a tornado. But throw, throw in the, the Texas landscape, the Texas Panhandle landscape with the wonderful red dirt and the mamatas clouds above and, and, the, and the sunset, Man, and you got a winner. There's just there's just so many opportunities uh, out there to to take some good good photos in the springtime. Uh, little little history about me, other than other than what Steve had said. Like I like he said, I had been chasing a storm since about 1985, and and uh, we we are in the process right now of updating our Guinness Book of World Records uh, that we had originally uh, established back in 2012, updated in 2014 and 2017, and. And hopefully, uh, I was actually just in touch with the, uh, the Guinness World Book uh, today, and hopefully we'll get this thing updated for next year. Uh, again, uh, I am co-owner of Silver Lining Tours, along with my wife, Karen Hill, uh, and uh, Silver Lining Tours has been around since 1997, and Karen and I have owned it since uh, 2013. Uh, as Steve said, I've, we've been on a lot of TV shows and there's one neat thing about television is publicity sells. And when, when we took over the tours, it was still a kind of a fledgling company and, and uh, we could just you know, push for all the publicity that we can find. Uh, you know, people, people uh, don't know about you, they're not gonna come on your tours. Uh, so anyway, our photography has been all over as well, also through Nat Geo, just, uh, the Weather Channel Discovery and a lot of other networks. And uh, you know, as, as Steve said, I love slot canyons in the American Southwest outside of our storm uh, chasing season, which runs from April through uh, July. We actually go down to Tucson, Arizona in, uh, the, in the end of July through August, and we do lightning photography and landscape workshops down there as well. Uh, and then in the, in the fall and spring before uh, storm chasing season uh, runs, I, I do slot canyon hiking photography tours. And no, we don't go to Antelope Canyon and places like that. Uh, I've explored a, a close to 100 different slot canyons in the Colorado Plateau and Utah and Arizona, and even a few in, in New Mexico and, and uh, uh, Western Colorado. Uh, and there are some absolutely jaw-dropping, gorgeous slot canyons out there, as pretty as Antelope. Uh, but the problem is, is you have to four-wheel to get out to them. And a lot of people don't know how to, how to get out to them or, or, or even aware of these canyons. But my goodness, it can be so pretty. And then we do another tour uh, uh, called our Magical Lands Tour. We visit some some really popular places like White Pocket and uh, uh, Shiprock and uh, the Visty Badlands and then you know places uh, kind of some places off the road in, in the Colorado Plateau as well. So uh, keeps us busy a lot of times. The winter time we use that time to uh, to uh, uh, promote all of our tours. Uh, you know uh, for the for the springtime uh, we are. Out of 160 slots that we have open on our storm chasing tours next year, we have eight spots left. So they're they're almost booked out and then we're already booking 2023. Silver Lining Tours, that's that's our company name. And uh, our slogan is it's the atmospheric adventure of a lifetime. It is a lot of fun. And uh, the interesting interesting thing here is the background image. Uh, this image was taken near uh, Pilgrim, Nebraska on June 16th, 2014. And these are twin F4 strength violent tornadoes that were less than a half a mile apart. And it had been the first time since the super outbreak that actually hit your, your lovely state back in the 1970s that uh, caused all that damage in Xenia and many other places in the state of Ohio. Uh, it's been the first time that uh, since that event that something like that had happened. It's kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Again, Silver Lining Tours was founded in 1997. We're the second oldest and largest uh, tour operator in the country. Uh, my origi the original owner and my partner uh, until 2013 was a gentleman named Dr. David Gold, who has a PhD in atmospheric science from uh, Texas A&M University. 
He got his, he's got his bachelor's degree and his master's from the University of Oklahoma, and then went to A&M to uh, get his PhD. Uh, his partner back when it was founded in the 90s was a gentleman named Bill Gargan, who's the uh, lead forecaster at the National Weather Service office in Topeka. And uh, Dave and I, again, partnered in 2003, and then Karen and I took over in uh, 2013. Well, we offer a lot of different types of, of tours. It depends on, depending on what you're looking for, for, for excitement. Uh, our first tour that we do in, the, in uh, each year is, is held in mid-late April called the Close Encounters Tour. And it's a small tour that we operate basically due to the purpose, because our whole idea is to push the envelope and get you close. I want my tour guests on this particular tour to be able to get outside next to a uh, next to a tornado where you can smell the, the 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 stench in the air from a tornado yeah they smell bad they because they're stirring up stuff that hasn't been stirred up for a hundred years uh i want you to be able to smell it i want you to see debris flying around and i want you to feel the rumble in your chest because a tornado has a unique uh, feel and sound all to its own a lot of people say it sounds like a freight train no i hate to disagree it sounds like a waterfall it sounds like a just a, a major waterfall because you have all this rushing wind that's hitting the ground and spreading out and it creates a lot of friction with the ground and a lot of noise. Uh, our core tours, which are our tour number two through seven, are conducted during the peak of tornado season and they are the largest tours that we have and typically uh, we, we have five different uh, Chevy Express vans that are totally customized for, for, uh, for storm chasing. And uh, these, during the, the core tours, we operate three of those. Uh, and we, have, we take out the back seats for folks to put luggage and camera gear and tripods and things like that. All the seats in the vans have power inverters, uh, power outlets uh, with them, and also uh, USB ports to charge cell phones and you know, whatever you want to charge. Uh, and uh, those tours are either six, seven, or 10 days long with our tour number four, the last 10 days of May, uh, being the, uh, the, the longest one. And we've never shortened that up because all of our tour guests have said, please keep this tour long. And that's the first tour we have typically that sells out every year. Uh, the other, uh, some of the other tours we run, uh, we, I do a lecture tour where uh, it's basically designed for those who want more of an educational experience. Uh, they want to learn about what makes a storm tick and what makes a storm form and know how to read a weather map and know how to uh, look at forecasting models and uh, these wonderful diagrams that are called photographs and skew T diagrams that uh, basically take a take a snapshot of the atmosphere and can, can tell you a lot about what's going to happen on a particular severe weather day. Then we run a July tour uh, called the uh, Great North Tornado Hunt. And a lot of people think as you get into the July period that you don't get tornadoes around the U.S. anymore. And that's not true. Uh, the, the high plains, the northern plains, and even the Canadian prairies are, are uh, notorious for big, slow-moving, beautiful supercells. Uh, because of weaker wind shear at the ground level, uh, you have a tendency to get less tornadoes than you do in May and even in June. Uh, but you can see some just amazing storm structure and your summer storms actually have a tendency to be a lot more electrified uh, than the than the spring the earlier spring storms do due to a lot more instability and, and uh, generated by heat. We also sometimes believe it or not we'll see the aurora borealis we, we had an instance a few years ago where we were chasing a uh, tornadic supercell in uh, Saskatchewan uh, just across the uh, United States border. And we, we had this absolutely beautiful storm over yellow canola fields. And it was just a treat in itself. And then earlier that day, a, a CME had hit the earth, a coronal mass ejection from the sun had hit the earth. And uh, that evening, as the sun went down at 10 o'clock at night, we had an absolute phenomenal aurora borealis that came out from, a, from about 10 o'clock at night until almost two o'clock in the morning. So we found ourselves a nice uh, secluded place north of uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, on this lake and sit there for half the night filming the auroras. And it's, that's a lot of fun. It really is. All of these tours uh, that I described above are led by myself. And some of the other tours uh, that we offer to are photography tours. And those photography tours are led by my wife, Karen, who has 20 years of experience. They are very small tours. 
These tours are typically one van due to the photographic aspect. It's nice just having the six people on a, on a particular tour. So there's a lot of interaction that goes on between all the tour guests and then uh, my wife and, and the other tour guide. And you get a lot of instruction and, and a lot of uh, uh, you know discussion on, on photographic techniques on uh, how to set up for a storm and shoot, which we're gonna talk about here in just a few minutes. Uh, and then one of the photography tours at the very end of June is actually led by my wife and myself both. Uh, it's the only only time that she and I are both available to uh, to lead one together, and that's a that's an awesome tour. It's a lot of fun. She also runs a, a, a very small, short duration tour in the middle of May for those who are basically have limited time to come out on a tour. And this particular tour is called the May Mini Tour, and it's a, just a four day tour. Oh, and, and just, just by the way, if anybody wants to see our, our website, uh, www.silverliningtours.com. Like every cloud is a silver lining. That's how it got its name. Uh, okay, let's go on. Uh, perks of doing a, a tour with us. Well, we have a lot of experience. We've been doing it longer than anybody has. We have uh, many experienced guides. Most of my guides are either experienced storm chasers or they're meteorologists. And I've had a, a few of our tour guides that are actually have been that had been guests on our tours over the years. And we usually try to have somebody on tour who is either an EMT or a doctor or a nurse, just in case uh, you come across a, a damage scene, which we've uh, had happen many times. Uh, and nothing, nothing uh, crazier than being the first on the scene after a big tornado goes through and destroys a farm and you have to uh, jump out of the van and, and uh, you know, try to assist in a little search and rescue until uh, the authorities get there. Uh, nice thing also is you can sit back and enjoy the trip and look, watch the countryside. Uh, boy, I tell you, there are a lot of people think that the plain states of the United States are boring and lifeless and they are anything but. There, there are so many really cool features from Texas all the way up through the Dakotas. Uh, and uh, a, a, lot, a lot of times on the photography tours, Karen will get you out and, and uh, shoot Americana and, and get those sunrise shots if it's not gonna be a big chase day. You never chase every day because the weather doesn't work that way. You know, you, you typically don't get storms every day all spring long. If that was the case, the whole plains of the United States would be completely destroyed. So, so uh, you, you, you chase troughs of low pressure and then when you get ridges of high pressure, that gives you sunshine. And it's any of those down days that we have is where Karen gets out and uh, you may go find some old deserted uh, farmsteads or you may go to places like, you know, Devil's Tower or the Badlands or, or you know, any, any really neat places that we can, that we can find that are, that are close by. But it's always a storm chase first. And then uh, any other any other type of Americana stuff comes comes second. Everybody wants to get those those shots of supercell thunderstorms, which if you can see this picture in the background here, that was a supercell thunderstorm near the uh, booming metropolis of Satanta, Kansas, back on uh, May twenty first of, of twenty twenty. And uh, this storm didn't produce a tornado, and in this particular case, I didn't care. You, you know, a tornado does not necessarily make the shot. Uh, the storm structure, the lightning, the landscapes, uh, all all make the shot. Uh, another thing that you get is you get a you get a a tour T-shirt, and at the end of the season, you get a DVD that covers every tour on the, that we did the entire season. Uh, every tour that we run, I always conduct a weather 101 class at the beginning of the tour on the first day. And uh, I give you a, a copyrighted book that that uh, is about 40 pages long that, uh, you know, just, just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what makes storms tick and how they form and some of the different types of storms that you can see on, uh, on a tour. Now, there are a lot of different types of thunderstorms, uh, single cells, multi cells, pulse storms, but the prettiest storm by far then the longest lived and most violent storm by far is a supercell thunderstorm. And a supercell thunderstorm is a storm that rotates. And that helps to hope to keep that updraft, all that moisture and uh, the liquid and ice all congealed into one cylindrical column that may be five to seven miles across. And a lot of times they'll look like a spaceship or they may look like a barber pole or a stack of dinner plates. And if you see a storm that looks like that, typically it's gonna be around for a long time and do a lot of crazy, crazy things. Uh, for my lecture tour, I actually have a, a, a bigger 
workbook that we that we use and we we go over all kinds of different things uh, uh a lot of the stuff may not mean anything to you uh you know right now because it it's, may not be your field but you know like, again we get into things like uh, uh you know how to interpret the sky uh how to look at surface hop you know if i have a temperature that's a 90 outside and a dew point of 70 what does that mean what, what does that get you uh, you know, and also we look at, at Doppler radar images and satellite and things like that to 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 uh, help folks be able to interpret it and then chase on their own if they so so desire to. Then we look at forecasting models, and uh, there's so many different forecast models out there. Whether you're looking at short range, medium range, or long range, and uh, uh, they 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 are some of them are really good and some of them aren't. Uh, but anyway, uh, you get a booklet for that as well. And then on the photography tours, there's a lot of uh, instruction, which we're going to talk about here in just a second, and a lot of field learning as well. A typical day on a tour, depending on which tour you're on, uh, we meet in the morning. Uh, myself and my tour guides will get up and we'll look at the models and we'll we'll uh, come up with our with what we think the best potential is on this particular day. And then we'll, we'll all meet together and, uh, and discuss where we think the target area is, uh, what the weather analysis is, uh, you know, why, why do we think this one spot looks better than another spot. And then, uh, you know, usually by nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, depending on how far we have to drive, uh, we take off and we drive. Uh, and the whole idea is to get in position where we think storms are going to form before anything happens. Uh, I, there's a, we get a lot of guests that uh, not only are photographers, but they also love to do time lapses. And to time lapse a storm from a developing of a, of a small cumulus cloud all the way through uh, the mature stage of a thunderstorm and uh, you know have it drop a tornado or be real electrified and get some of that in a time lapse is just just amazing to do. So I like to get us out there you know before anything goes so you can you can just see the whole process. Uh, and we chase hard. We stay with that storm, uh, regardless what type of a tour that it is. We stay with it all the way through the evening hours. And typically, uh, we will stay with that till the storm gets into the dissipation stage. Once the structure starts to disappear and the lightning goes away, then we wave goodbye to it and head off to our hotel, which uh, either Karen or myself uh, will have reserved earlier that particular day. We're very transient, as you can expect. We go where weather goes. Weather is fluid. It's always in motion. You may be chasing a weather system that comes out of the Rocky Mountains on, on one particular day and chase it in the high plains. And the next day, you may be in the, the central plains. And then the next day, you may be in the Midwest. You know, And then you have to turn around and drive back to the West and catch the next weather system that, that, that comes out. So we're always on the go. We never know where we're going to be day to day, and that's actually kind of, kind of some of the fun of it. You know, not 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 knowing where you're where you're going to be at, uh, it, it gets some really really cool surprises that way. Yeah, this particular tornado that you see in the background of this one was spawned by a supercell and and near the booming metropolis of Capital Montana, which is in the southeastern corner of Montana, about 50 miles northeast of Devil's Tower. This storm dropped eight tornadoes, and this particular violent category tornado uh, was uh, less than a mile away from us. And you see the streaky drops that on, on here, that's hailstones and raindrops that are wrapping around that tornadic circulation. And uh, don't worry, it wasn't moving toward us, it was moving away. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, but, and fortunately, it didn't hit a whole lot because there was nothing out there to hit, which, which made it really nice. But in summary, a lot uh, we have a large variety of tours to choose from. Tours are educational. The neat thing is you meet a lot of like-minded folks because everybody wants to see and talk to people, uh, you know, who have that same type of an interest. Uh, you get to see parts again of the U.S. again, uh, like I mentioned, that most don't pay attention to. Uh, hey, if you're in the Texas Panhandle and we have a down day and then some extra time, we may go down to Palo Duro Canyon, which is the Grand Canyon of Texas. But we may be in Southwest Texas and head down to uh, to the Rio Grande. Uh, or, or if you're in uh, northeast New Mexico, which we spend a lot of time in the high plain, you may be around Capulin Volcano Monument. Uh, or you know, again, you get up into eastern Wyoming and western Nebraska around the sand hills and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Scotts Bluff National Monument and on up through uh, the Badlands and, and in eastern Wyoming, eastern uh, uh, Montana, the west, western North Dakota, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Now, there's there's so many places that a lot of people just 
don't pay much attention to. And, uh, but uh, we do, we do a lot. And also, you'll learn how to photograph storms the right way. And of course, you have perks for, from the tours for coming out with us. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Am I, am I at volume level okay? Good, okay, great. Storm photography is like, is like a lot of other photography and it's always chasing the light. Uh, and that's one thing we're gonna talk about is, is chasing the light and trying to position yourself around a thunderstorm uh, to get the optimum results. It just depends on, on what you're looking for. Also how to compose your shot. We're also gonna look at uh, some of the equipment that you may need other than uh, you know, the ordinary uh, equipment that you'd have when you're out doing landscape photography. And then we're also going to talk about mitigating dangerous conditions. Thunderstorms are dangerous. Thunderstorms produce a lot of severe weather. Tornadoes are by far not the only thing that you have to worry about. And we're going to talk about some of those. But first of all, chasing the light, it all, it's always important to position yourself around a storm, uh, depending on what your goals are. Uh, do you want the storm to look one particular way or another? Uh, storms and tornadoes between yourself and the sun have a dark and menacing look of, of appearance to them. Obviously, if you're in the foreground and, that's, and the light is way in the distance and the storm is between you and the light and you're looking toward that light, the storm is going to look dark. Uh, positioning yourself to the south, looking north, often gives the best depth of field. Uh, but putting yourself where the sun is behind your back and the storm is to your east, the storm will look bright and white. The worst place that you want to be is to the north looking south. It offers the pores a view of the storm and it can also be one of the most dangerous places to be on a storm because most of the rain and hail and the lightning occurs to the east and north of a supercell thunderstorm. If you're on the south side of it looking toward the west or northwest, it gives you the best view of storm structure and it also uh, keeps you for the most part in the safest place. Let's just take a look at some of those examples. This is a shot from my wife from one of her photography tours. Uh, this was taken uh, uh, near Lincoln, Kansas, back on uh, May 21st, 2016. This is a supercell thunderstorm, and you can see it also has a tornado forming, just getting ready to touch down right in the middle of it, right, up, right to the right of where the road is. But the interesting thing about supercell thunderstorms is you can see the cloud material kind of has that striated look to it and it almost looks like it's in layers. That's because the storm is rotating. And again, putting yourself where the sun is behind the storm makes the storm look dark and menacing, but you can also see on the bottom left side, you get some blowout and uh, there's just not much way to eliminate that completely unless you adjust your camera maybe a little bit more to the right uh, to get rid of some of that, but then you may lose some of the cloud structure. Uh, it's, it's a neat way to look and to have a storm look just absolutely scary. This is my favorite position to, to, uh, to view a thunderstorm from. This supercell thunderstorm, I was south of it, looking north toward the updraft. The big spiraling feature you see on the left half of this feature is called a, a thunderstorm's updraft. Every thunderstorm has an updraft and every thunderstorm has a downdraft. The updraft is where all the warm moist air rises and condenses and rain and hail forms. And then when you get enough wind shear to cause the thunderstorm to rotate, you get these striated look to it. It almost kind of looks like a stack of dinner plates. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's the rotating part of the storm. And right underneath that, you can see a little tiny tornado that's, that's actually formed. The feature on the bottom right that you see a long line of skinny kind of whitish grayish clouds that's referred to as an inflow band. And when you see that, that feature is actually streaming into the updraft. So that cloud is moving from right to left. And if you did a time lapse on this, this whole thing would be spinning like this and you would see that inflow band streaming into it and wrapping around it as well. And there's an old storm chaser saying, if you look at the uh, right side of that, where that green color is, that's called hail core green. When you see green like that in a supercell thunderstorm, that's usually indicative of a lot of very large hail. This particular supercell formed on July 13th, 2009, quite a few years ago. 
and it formed over the Black Hills right near the town of Sturgis, South Dakota. At noon, this particular shot was taken at about 9, 9.30 in the evening near Valentine, Nebraska, and this storm had been going for over 200 miles, spinning and twisting and producing hail the size of grapefruits and a few tornadoes along the way. And finally, at midnight, the storm started to weaken, and we just stood up and waved the white flag and said, okay, we've been chasing this thing for 12 hours now. Everybody was tired and done taking pictures and video and watching the storm and was ready to get to the hotel. But what a day. I mean, is that a thing of beauty or what? That's, that's just, that's one of my all-time favorite picks. Uh, it really is. Now, with the storm to your east, the interesting thing about this is that you don't see any structure. You don't see the striations. You don't see the stack of plates look because you're on the backside of it. And it's the air that's streaming into and up into the storm that causes those striated looks. Now you get a nice white appearance from the backside. And if you so happen to have a tornado, uh, it'll, it'll look white. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's a different, different appearance from this side. Uh, my wife, Karen, she, when you have a nice substantial tornado on the ground, she loves to be on the west side looking to the east or the southwest side looking toward the northeast to get a, to get a white tornado. Uh, the tornadoes are different colored depending on where they are in, in perspective to your position and light, obviously. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the way it looks going from different, different, side, different points. This particular image you see on the background of this, this is another one of Karen shots of a tornado that occurred near Carpenter, Wyoming, which is uh, east of Cheyenne. And she positioned herself to the south, looking toward the north, northwest. And uh, I like the curved road in there and the windmill on the ground level right underneath the tornado. Uh, this was an F2 tornado that actually uh, hit, hit the little town of Carpenter. And uh, one of uh, nine tornadoes that Supercell produced that day. When you're composing your shot for storms, though, as you can see in most of my images, the rule of thirds is thrown out the window. Uh, you, you just don't want to lose that much cloud structure. I, I prefer to have about one fifth of my image be ground and then the rest of it be the storm and the storm structure. Uh, that's just my personal, personal opinion. Uh, some other people may tell you something different. And you often have to play with aperture and ISO uh, settings to get the best light without sacrificing too much. You know, you, you, you generally are not putting it on auto and taking pictures because if you're looking at a white cloud that has a dark ground underneath it or vice versa, uh, it, it's gonna play wreak havoc with your settings. So just a matter of tweaking it typically in manual mode uh, to be able to, uh, to, to uh, get the best of both worlds. Uh, sometimes even using a gradual, graduated ND filter uh, works really, really well. If I have a, a really white looking storm with a, with a uh, real pretty ground, you want to kind of dull the look of that, of that, that cloud so it doesn't blow out your image. Uh, neutral and uh, graduated ND filters work really well. But supercells, as you can see, are, can be very, very photogenic. Therefore, go wide. That's, that's what she preaches on her, on her photography tours. She tries, she keeps everybody back away from the storm so you can get that wide angle shot of the entire storm structure and then if there's a tornado then she'll get in close to it so you can get a closer shot of, a, of the tornado but sometimes even staying back to get the storm structure shot and also have that tornado uh, can be quite quite an amazing shot uh, tornadoes though to me in my opinion are, are best photographed either zoomed way in uh, or very wide to get that storm structure as well uh, lightning can be captured day or night if you don't have a device that we always recommend called a lightning trigger, which uh, attaches to your where your plunger goes into the side of your camera, sets on top of your hot shoe, and uses a, a photo cell to detect an electrical discharge, it will actually, when a lightning flash or strike occurs, it'll trip your shutter and take a picture of it. Uh, but if you don't have one of those devices, a, a, a very a very strong ND filter is the best to use in the daytime to try to get a longer exposure. And you just sit there and click, 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 or just, you know, put your plunger on and just keep taking picture after picture. But the best way by far to take, get lightning in the daytime is with, a, with the lightning trigger. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in just a second. Always remember when you have a little bit longer exposure, maybe even more than a second or two, clouds are moving. 
And sometimes in supercell thunderstorms, they can be moving as much at 100 to 150 miles an hour as they rotate. So if you can't get a faster exposure, you're going to get some boring. And, and uh, that's sometimes that boring can actually give you some really cool effects as well. Uh, but just a, just a little bit of warning there. Uh, <laughs> cool tornado. Uh, this was near uh, Lockett, Texas, in the northwest part of Texas last April. And uh, this particular supercell formed and went right by to my north. We had rain and hail wrapping around the backside of it and started making rainbows and, uh, you know, with the sun off to the west. And I'm like, let's just stay on the backside of this thing. And lo and behold, one tornado after another, after another, after another touchdown. And oh, what a treat to have a lightning or to have a, a, a nice white looking tornado and a rainbow to go to boot. Equipment that you need, though, digital SLR, whatever you want to use. It doesn't make any difference. You any camera, any, any model can use. I'm a Canon guy, always been a Canon guy. Uh, I have a I have a Mark III, a 5D Mark III that I had converted to to a uh, an infrared uh, camera, and then I have a, a 5D Mark IV. That's my main camera. I actually bought a, a Canon R5, uh, the mirrorless version, and I hated it for storm photography. It was just not good, and I got rid of it. Uh, it was it was great for landscape, but for storm photography, I just could not get that thing to. To, to give me a really, really good picture the way my Mark IV, my, my 5D Mark IV did. So I went back to, to using my Mark IV again. Uh, there's a variety of lenses. Again, being a full frame camera with what I had, I use, and these are the lenses that I use. I have an 1124 F4L. That's a nice, big, wide, heavy lens, uh, you know, really expensive lens, but my goodness, uh, the, that 11 millimeter width on that thing is just amazing. It, it gives you some really cool storm structure shots. Uh, the workhorse, on, uh, even though it's an F4, Canon's 24 to 105 lens, I wish they'd make an F2.8, that would be awesome. Uh, but that, that is a, a great lens to leave on all the time. Uh, in, unless you're looking for those really wide shots or you want to really zoom in tight, I use also a, a, a 70 to 200 F2.8L, and then I have uh, the 16 to 35 uh, uh, th uh, a third generation F2.8L. Those are the lenses I use. I, I carry all, all with me all the time, and uh, they were great. The lightning trigger, again, uh, there's a company out there actually based in Dolores, Colorado, down on the Four Corners near Durango. Uh, called Lightning Trigger, and uh, that's their website, lightningtrigger.com. If you're going to get into lightning photography, whether you're out here doing it or you're even in Ohio shooting thunderstorms there and you want to get some cool lightning shots, uh, you can pick up the trigger from uh, the gentleman. His name is Rich Davis, and if you mention that we send, sent you to him, he will give you a 10% discount. The triggers run about $375. They're not cheap. Uh, but they are amazing and they work really, really well for, for uh, capturing lightnings. Uh, sturdy tripod and head. I have three Getso tripods and three really right stuff uh, tripod heads. I love really right stuff tripod heads with a quick release. You can get them on and off really fast. Uh, a key though is you got to make sure that whatever tripod you're using, boy, uh, when you get around a thunderstorm environment, you can get gusty outflow winds coming from the thunderstorm, or you can even get what are called an inflow jet, that winds that are getting sucked into that updraft. And these winds can gust anywhere from 60 to 100 miles an hour. So if you don't have your hand on your tripod, not a good thing. And I, I can't tell you how many video cameras and even a couple of still cameras that I've lost by taking my hand off of my tripod, turning around to get another lens. And during that time, a stinking wind gust hit and took it right down to the ground. Uh, yeah, not, not nice, not nice at all. Uh, filters, I absolutely recommend without a doubt, a circular polarizer, because you can dial it in there to get whatever kind of exposure that you're looking for. Uh, neutral density filters, uh, however strong you want to use. I have a dialable ND, that's a Singray filter that uh, I go from one to 24 stops. And uh, man, they're, they're awesome. They're really, really good. Also have plenty of cleaning materials because you're in an environment where there's blowing dirt, blowing sand, blowing dust, pebbles, all kinds of stuff flying through the air. Never change your, your, your lenses when you're out there. Get back in a, in a vehicle and change your lens. 
then get back out there. Otherwise, you're going to have dust specks all over your sensor. And that's that's just, that's no fun. <laughs> it really isn't sitting there trying to clone them all out in Photoshop. This is a, is a, not, not a lot of fun at all. Dangerous conditions. Yeah, look at this. Look at this hailstones. There's hail, these hailstones actually were between softball and grapefruit size. And they fell from a thunderstorm near Chugwater, Wyoming, right north of Cheyenne, west of Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And uh, when you're outside and you have gigantic hail starting to fall, you can hear it sizzle through the air. And then it thunks like uh, really loud when it hits the ground. And you out there and you're, you see this kind of stuff, I always, we always make our guests get back in the car immediately. You think, you think of a major league baseball pitcher hurling a baseball at 95 mile an hour and hitting a batter in the head. Uh, yeah, it can, it can hurt. Well, think of a two pound chunk of ice falling at terminal velocity at 120 miles an hour, hitting somebody in the head. It can kill. Animals get killed out on the plains every year. I mean, even big animals, horses, cattle, sheep, yeah, uh, like that can get can get hit. I got hit once in the head with a golf ball size hailstone and almost knocked me out. I got hit in the collarbone with a tennis ball size hailstone and it took me to the ground. It hurt so bad. I thought I broke my collarbone. Uh, got to be very respectful of that. And another thing you got to be very, very respectful for is lightning. Uh, we had an incident that I'm going to show you here in a second. What happened, we had an incident where one of our vans got hit with a bolt. Uh, again, I've been doing this for 37 years, and uh, that only had it happen one time. But uh, it's sure, uh, sure, a, a kind of a frightening uh, time to have it happen. Uh, but always count the number of seconds between a flash of lightning and the sound of thunder. Light, of course, travels 186,000 miles per second. Sound travels at 1,100 feet per second. So when you see that flash, uh, count the number of seconds divided by 1100 and that tells you basic or, or divided by five excuse me and that because sound travel at 1100 feet per second that'll tell you how many seconds how many miles away that a lightning bolt hit so if you have a flash of lightning and it took 10 seconds before the thunder was there divide that by five it equals two so the lightning strike was two miles away if you start getting lightning consistently within two or three miles for you move don't take that risk it's not worth it never stop with a tornado. We never stop with a tornado on the ground unless we have an escape route. And uh, you better be using a lot of different sources. Uh, uh, if you're using Google Maps, uh, that's a good source. Uh, we use we use GPS mapping software and Google Maps, and then we have uh, uh, Doppler radar that we can actually uh, load mapping software over and put, and also put our position on it. So we can always keep ourselves in a, in, a, in a safe position. Worst thing in the world is driving through flooded roadways. You're out in the middle of the country and you see water gushing across a, a gravel road. You don't know if that road's been washed away or what. And there's nothing worse than getting out there and falling into a hole that's two or three feet deep and rolling your vehicle over and you being on underneath it with water flowing over the top of you. Not, not, a, not a good thing. But again, hail can kill. It can grow to the size of soccer balls and, and falls at 120 miles an hour on average. And that's a, that's a pretty dangerous situation. There you go. We were near the town of Plentywood, Montana, in the northeast corner of Montana, just on the U.S. side of the Canadian border. In uh, July of 2018, and we had a, a tornado warm supercell come across the border, coming right for us. And we were watching the storm starting to look really pretty and starting to produce a lot of lightning. And uh, my, my wife is, is very aware of what the surroundings are around her. I'm sitting out there taking pictures and she said, honey, we need to move. This, this lightning is getting too close. And uh, yeah, it was. So we jumped in the van, moved down the road about five miles and stopped. And uh, of course the storm is still coming at us. And uh, it, it got within two or three miles of us again. And she's like, all right, get in the vans. Let's get out of here. We got in the vans, started the drive down the road, and bam, bolt of lightning hit that antenna, what's left of that antenna that is now welded permanently to the top of the van. And you can see the black burnt area around it. Uh, Karen was sitting right underneath that antenna inside the van when the lightning bolt hit us and we were moving and she got a really bad headache from it. 
But that bolt of lightning went down. When you're sitting in a vehicle, you get what's called the Faraday cage effect. And that disperses the lightning's electricity all over the surface of, of a vehicle since it's metal. That lightning traveled down the sides of the van and it actually went down the rear door of the van, blew a chunk of paint out about that big around, arced down to the ground. And our second vehicle behind us saw concrete asphalt flying up in the air with a bolt arced to the ground. And then it blew out the tires on the van and everything electronic in that vehicle was dead. This van was totaled. Uh, it, they could not fix it. When we took it into uh, a, a Chevy dealership in, in uh, Sydney, Montana, they kept it there and they looked at it and they're like, every circuit in this thing is fried. It would cost us, it cost fifteen dollars to $20,000 to rip everything out and put all new circuitry in there. And then you still don't know what happened mechanically with every piece that's in that van. And uh, it was just not worth it. So the insurance company totally. Uh, and, and of course, tornadoes are, are a major risk. You got to, like I said, we never stop without having an escape route. You got to have some way to get out of the way. Tornado damage, this particular mile wide F4 tornado just destroyed these silos and, and knocked down the power lines. And then it destroyed that farmstead right there on the right side. And uh, it's never a pretty thing to see, but it's a, it's a reality when you're out there chasing storms. Uh, tornadoes kill, they maim, they destroy. And uh, we never take the light in that. And we never like to stop to take damaged pictures. Uh, you got to respect the people who own the property. And uh, we, you know, we can, you want to take a picture of it from the road, that's fine. But we don't go up there unless we're there to help. I, I think that's, that's only fair. Yeah, storm, lightning, and tornado photography. I'm going to, I have, a, I have a, about 20 transparencies. Do I, do I have time to go over 20 transparencies? Okay, okay, great. Uh, and, and I just want to talk to you about a little bit about what happened with each one of these images that you, that you see. And first of all, this image is taken from one of our lightning photography workshops that we run out of Tucson during the monsoon season in late July and August. And uh, this is a three image composite uh, that was taken near the town of Oracle, Arizona, right north of, of Tucson. But uh, the neat thing about those two, about those uh, workshops are storms form very, uh, very religiously near the same time every day when you're in, in the monsoons. They typically form early to mid afternoon. They form over the highlands first and the mountain ranges, a lot of mountain ranges, uh, the, the, Cana, the, the Catalina Mountains north of Tucson, the Santa Rita's to the south, the Chiricoyas to the east, uh, a lot of different mountain ranges that we go to to photograph storms. And some of them, you can get a lot of cactus varieties in it. Some of them, you have to wait until they move off the mountain ranges down into the deserts to hit the, the Ocotillos and the Saguaros and the, the, the Choyas and, and such to uh, get those in your shop. But my goodness, they are so much fun. They really are a lot of fun. This, <laughs> this storm was taken near Douglas, Kansas on June 26, 2018. And we call this a mothership. And you can see why. Uh, it, you have all these layers of the storm and that all represents air that is being channeled into it and being sucked upwards. The updraft of a thunderstorm is a vacuum cleaner. It's taking in air from the ground around it and channeling it straight up, sometimes as much as three to 400 feet per second. And if the storm is rotating, you, the, the clouds, instead of looking straight up and down, will get these striated appearances to them like a either a mothership or a stack of plates. Uh, but, but this particular storm was just incredibly electrified. And the neat thing about this storm, we, have, we were all set up with our, with our tripods up around the, the van on this particular spot, looking to the Northwest. This is again, we were Southeast of this looking Northwest and this storm was anchored. It wasn't moving. Uh, and that was, that was a treat. To, to have a storm just sitting still. There was a, a what's, what's called an outflow boundary uh, that the storm had formed on and it anchored itself to it and just sat there. It was quite a, quite a fun day. You know, the one I told you about earlier that we looked at uh, from, from that formed over the Black Hills and then you know, just moved its way all the way until midnight when we finally quit chasing it anymore over Valentine. Got into the Nebraska Sound Hills. Now this particular shot, I had it, I had it mostly cloud structure and very little ground. I have a few of the shots that I actually did more of the rule of thirds to look at it. 
and it really, in my opinion, it took away from it because it, it didn't get all the cloud structure and, and more of the ground, which even though the ground is kind of interesting, but the Nebraska sand hills, it just wasn't as interesting to me as, as the cloud structure was on this particular case. This is my wife, Karen Schott. And uh, this was a supercell thunderstorm on the Palmer Divide here in Colorado uh, from 2012, June 7th of 2012. And we get a lot of severe weather in Eastern Colorado. Uh, people don't realize that. But one other really interesting thing about the high plains is visibility. Uh, you can see forever out here. You don't have to worry about the smog and the, a lot of the moisture that traps a lot of pollutants, like when you're in the Southern Plains and the Southeast and such uh, in the high plains. That, that that type of a scenario doesn't exist. You you get you get moisture that streams upslope, and as the up as moisture rises, you get thunderstorms that occur. And this particular supercell thunderstorm was a jaw dropper. She happened to find one lone tree sitting out in the middle of uh, of the Colorado prairie lands, and, uh, and this is one of my favorite shots of hers. I I just love this shot. This particular storm didn't move very fast either. It was moving at about 10 or 15 miles an hour, but she kept herself back away from it so that uh, she could get a whole shot of the structure and everything of this particular super shell. What a beauty, what, what a beauty. Wow, this is another one. Uh, this was taken uh, near Northfield, Texas in the Texas Panhandle right off of the Cap Rock. The Cap Rock is a really pretty area of the Texas Panhandle. You have the flatlands of the on top of the Cap Rock, and then the elevation drops 800 to 1,000 feet as you come off the Cap Rock. Believe it or not, there's slot canyons there, there's red rock there, and right where moisture streams from the lower elevations upward on top of the Cap Rock, you get supercells that form. Texas Panhandle is a hot spot. This particular storm formed on uh, May 23rd of 2016, right about sunset. It started looking really, really pretty. And then after dark, it started dropping tornadoes left and right. And uh, Karen and I both have a shot of this particular storm with a, an F3 tornado on the ground with multiple vortices coming down and a quadruple bolt of lightning that just strafed all the way across that instantly like that. You know, nighttime shooting lightning and such is much simpler because you just leave your shutter open, uh, you know, and, and just and just set your aperture to, you know, to, to depending on how close the lightning is, you know, the closer the lightning is, shut your aperture down, the further away it is, open it up, you know, and, and uh, you know, you try to get like a second or two, uh, you know, exposure, but uh, oh my goodness, beautiful, beautiful storm. That, this is a shot when those two F4 tornadoes, uh, first formed coming across uh, uh, northeastern Nebraska. This highway, I thought, just made a really cool view, uh, you know, with, a, with, with one violent tornado on one side of the road and one on the other. Uh, these tornadoes were moving very slow. After we sat there and took a few picks, we actually took off and drove right between them and, uh, and, and watched get on the other side of them and watch them come across the road. This, it, it's just amazing to, to watch, you know, nature's most violent storm. Uh, there's just nothing more violent than a tornado is in, in nature. They're more violent than a hurricane, even though a hurricane is uh, over a larger area. But uh, hey, it was a crazy, crazy day. That storm dropped four different F4 tornadoes that day. It was just insane. Northeast Colorado. You get into the prairies of Northeast Colorado, there are a lot of abandoned farmsteads, old schools, some old churches and such in some of the little towns that, have, uh, that are now ghost towns. And this particular shot was east of Sterling um, in 2019. And we came across this old abandoned schoolhouse and lo and behold, here's a severe thunderstorm with baseball size hail bearing down upon us. And uh, Karen and I were like, oh, let's just stop right here and set up and, and, and shoot. We got to sit there for about a half an hour, 45 minutes shooting the storm before it uh, came blasting over the top of us and ran us out of the way. But in this particular shot, yeah, this has a little bit more of a rule of thirds, maybe even 40% of the picture is, is the ground. But I thought the leading lines of the ground and the grass blowing into the storm and with the old abandoned schoolhouse just really made that really cool picture. And I, I like that shot. Here's what happens when you have a violent, violent tornado and you're really close to it. You can, I, I'm looking west, unfortunately. I had no other road 
to, to give me a, a, a different perspective of this. The bottom left corner is just complete blowout and there was nothing I could do about it. Uh, but just based on the road that I was on this, this, what would have been an F5 tornado ended up being an F4 tornado was less than a half a mile away from me. So close, you could smell it and hear it. And uh, it was, it was a, uh, Interesting to try to photograph this thing. You can see the, a little bit of the blurriness in the tornado because the winds in this particular tornado were, were spinning at 250 miles an hour. And it's, you, you gotta have a pretty pretty fast uh, shutter to be able to to, uh, uh, to to capture that with no blurriness. But, and you can even see the foreground is in focus, but uh, the, both sides of the ground uh, toward, the, toward the distance or not, as, as well as the, as the tornado. It was just, I did everything I could to try to get that thing in, in focus, but I yeah, didn't quite get it. One of my favorite shots, again, this is a supercell thunderstorm, and this is what we call a low precipitation supercell thunderstorm. Doesn't have a lot of rain and hail with it, uh, but what this storm did was it had a lot of lightning and this particular storm we refer to as a barber pole. And you can almost kind of see that barber's pole appearance to it. Just imagine the red and white stripes going up as the storm is spinning and circulating. Uh, you, you can almost see the layers of it uh, as it was rotating. And the storm produced a lot of lightning and was made some really nice photography. And this was, this was about 15 minutes after sunset, uh, which we could have got the ground a little bit better, but uh, yeah, that was a nice storm. Yeah, this is a violent class tornado. This was an F4. Anybody ever seen the program Lion uh, uh, Tiger King? Uh, if you ever saw Tiger King, uh, the Tiger King was talking about a tornado there that occurred, and this is that tornado. Uh, I pushed the envelope on this day, and uh, this is not my photo. This is actually a friend of mine's photo who got up on a hill and took it. You see those three white vans down there? That's me. And this tornado passed a block away from us and it was loud, it was noisy. And, it, but the one thing that it was, is was extremely well behaved. It did not veer one way or another from, uh, from its path. And uh, I told everybody, I said, we're gonna get close. I'm gonna get us close. We're gonna flip the vehicles around. And if we see it start to, to take any kind of a deviation away from its track, then we were jumping in the bands to get out of the way. And lo and behold, my friend snapped this picture of us as, uh, as the tornado went right by us. Uh, yeah, that, that was, that's something we do on the Close Encounters Tour. <laughs> Cause that was really close, <laughs> but uh, what a shot. This is my wife's shot of a supercell along the uh, South Dakota, Montana border. And when you get that kind of cow catcher look to the uh, inflow side of the storm, the left side, we were she, we were north looking south on the storm. And when you get that kind of cow catcher look to it, the storm is spinning hard. You can see the striations and there's a cloud right about lightning level that's referred to as a collar cloud. And uh, when you see a collar cloud on a supercell that kind of has that cow catcher or Liberty Bell look to it, it's spinning, it's spinning. And this particular storm, uh, went on. Uh, we ended up blasting on the, to the left of that storm and getting on the other side of it. And uh, what after right after we did that, it started dropping its uh, first of eight tornadoes. And uh, what a what a treat that was. A different perspective of positioning. This is this looking to the northwest, being on the southeast side of this particular tornado near McCook, Nebraska, on May seventeenth, uh, two thousand nineteen, and. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah, this, this, I, I, think, I think being on that south side gives you a really cool kind of a depth look to it uh, with the left side of the tornado being, being whiter and then the right side of the tornado being darker. Same with the supercell storm structure, the dark cloud base you see above it. And then the white clouds that you see to the left of the tornado where the sun was actually shining. Uh, supercells generate what's called a clear slot as winds sink and wrap around a circulation like that. And uh, it can really light up your subject very, very nicely, like it did in this particular shot. This was taken in Arizona on our uh, uh, monsoon uh, lightning photography workshops. And uh, I, I, I love this shot. I, I mean, it, the lightning bolts were extremely close, closer than I really wanted them to be. Uh, but the fact that the way the light was on the ground and the, and the uh, 
uh, the prickly pear cactus and, and such that you see all over the place, even a few little blooms there. And then uh, the, the lightning behind it, I, I just I just love this particular setup. And we had we had got probably seven or eight of these shots over a 30 minute period as a storm, but the storm was moving. And if you look at the left side of the image, you can see the motion in the clouds. And uh, that's this was a longer exposure. This was actually about a five second long exposure to try to capture that, but you get some of the boriness from the clouds actually moving. This is a shot of Karen's on her photography tour in eastern New Mexico near the town of Portales. There's a really, really neat old church out there. And once in a while, you get some really cool storms around there. And she set up her photography tour uh, so that uh, the, the, they, she had this in front of it. Uh, the sun is off on the backside of the church and then the thunderstorm off to the north. Unfortunately, didn't produce hardly any lightning, but still made a really cool picture with the, with the thunderstorm structure in the church. And you can even see a couple of crepuscular rays from the, from the, from the sun behind the, on the other side of the clouds. Uh, it made, a, made it for a really cool shot. This is a photo of mine from two years ago. I have a certain bucket list of photos that I want to get lightning from. <laughs> One of them was Devil's Tower. And uh, I got, we got very fortunate as we caught this uh, tornado worn supercell thunderstorm coming right over the top of it. Wish the fence wasn't there, uh, but whatever, you got to get what you can get. And this, this was a, a shot that I wanted with a bolt hitting the top of Devil's Tower. Uh, Nine years ago, I had another one of my bucket list lightning shots, and that was with a bolt of lightning between the mittens in Monument Valley. And uh, I was treated to a not only a bolt of lightning, but a double rainbow between the mittens. Uh, and and, and I, I had tried that shot for days, you know, over several years trying to get it and finally got the treat. Now, Karen and I have decided our next one is we're going to go to the Grand Canyon and camp out there in the monsoon season in August until we get it until we get a good shot at, in, the, in the evening time of a bolt hitting the bottom of the Grand Canyon. That's, that's a must. And I want one more over ship rock. And, uh, that, that's, a, that's a tough place to get lightning because you, the way the Chuska Mountains are to the west of ship rock, storms usually don't move that way. They move away from it. But uh, yeah, that would, that would be another fun one to catch. There's that violent tornado you saw a little while ago that this, this tornado actually formed from that supercell of my wife's picture where it had like the cow catcher look to it, that really cool bolt of lightning coming down. This, this was a very large uh, violent category, half mile wide, three quarter mile wide tornado that we just drove right up on the backside of and uh, were able to watch it. That was, a, that was quite the treat. This is another one of Karen shots from the Pawnee Glasslands in Northeast Colorado. There's an area of terrain between Colorado and Wyoming called the Cheyenne Ridge. And the Cheyenne Ridge generates a lot of thunderstorm because the elevation goes from about 4,500 feet north of Greeley, Colorado to 6,500 feet on top of the ridge. So anytime air is streaming in up and going up over the top of that, that lifting motion generates storms. And there's a lot of cool old buildings out there. This old barn with the bolt of lightning to the right uh, in a way that it just it just glowed when the bolt hit. Uh, I thought it made for a really cool shot. I didn't get that. She caught it. But my, my lightning trigger missed it. <laughs> that happens sometimes. This is a really neat area to chase into. This is in the Sand Hills of Nebraska near the town of Hemingsford, uh, Nebraska, uh, northwest of Alliance. And there is an old, old abandoned school that the paint's all coming off of, and they they will allow you. They won't let you, they won't let you go into the into the old school because the floor's all rotted, but they will allow you to sit outside there and uh, and shoot it. And even on a even on a nice day and with a pretty sunset or something like that makes it makes for a spectacular shot. But this particular shot has a uh, a, a line of thunderstorms with a lot of outflow, blowing dirt. You can see all the blowing dirt behind it. And if you look at the left side of the picture, uh, you can see a kind of a smooth grayish green area. And that was a lot of big, big hail that was coming down there. So we were able to sit there and, and shoot this thing. The light was off to the left. Uh, the sun was setting off to the left side there. But the way the light was and the dark clouds uh, coming over the top of that, I was like, oh yeah, we got to shoot this. We got to gotta get those that image. And yeah, this is uh, my wife's shot, and you, most of you, I'm sure, know where this is, uh, over uh, Sedona. 
And when we do our lightning photography workshops in Tucson, we go anywhere. It's not just around Tucson. We'll go all the way up to the Mugion Rim uh, and shoot the Red Rock up around Sedona. Heck, we've gone up to the Grand Canyon and tried to shoot up there. Uh, heck, uh, we'll go wherever, wherever it looks like. The Painted Desert, uh, you know, and out toward Winslow, great place for thunderstorms uh, over the top of the, all the different, uh, the, the chimney layer of, of, uh, of, the, of, of sandstone and mud is just make for spectacular image. This was shot up on a bluff uh, up by the airport near Sedona and uh, the storm hit, popped about seven or eight bolts and uh, managed to catch a good one. That's a really pretty one. <laughs> okay, this was a North Dakota July tornado and you can see the fields in front. Uh, and that's all canola. July is when all the canola blooms in the Northern Plains and the Canadian prairies. And the only thing better to me than this would have been having an old farm or an old barn out in the middle of that field instead of an active farm. Uh, but, but the canola can just light up really, really nice and yellow. And uh, sometimes you get into places, especially up, up in, uh, I don't know what it is about northern North Dakota and southern Alberta, where you get alternating fields of canola and flax. So you have a strip of yellow and a strip of periwinkle blue and a strip of yellow and a strip of periwinkle blue. And you get, you get all those alternating colors and you get a pretty storm over the top of that. Oh my goodness, it's just, just incredible. Love shooting that. Oh, this storm right here dropped six tornadoes over the yellow canola and uh, just made for some amazing photography. Many of you I'm sure have been to the Badlands in South Dakota. This shot was taken of a striated supercell thunderstorm approaching from the west. Uh, and then there are some of the spires from uh, Badlands National Park with the storm uh, coming toward us. And wasn't long after that, we kind of had to vacate the premises as it started getting really windy and some big, big hail started falling. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's just, the opportunities are endless out there. They really are. Single stroke of lightning. Uh, this was no, no spectacular storm. It was a weak supercell over the Oklahoma panhandle. But between the colors, the foreground, and uh, uh, the storm structure, and then this one just beautiful forking bolt of lightning. I love the shot. It's just, it's one of my favorite lightning shots. There's some, something about sometimes just getting that single stroke with all the branches that are coming out of it. A lot of my tour guests and photographers that come out with us, they call it hairy bolts. You know, it almost looks like there's hairs coming off of the lightning bolts. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are, those are so much fun. Last but not least, this is uh, my last one. And uh, this was taken this last summer uh, near York, Nebraska, over the Nebraska cornfields. And you can see all the corn, especially on the left. This is shot at 11 millimeter. And you can see the corn on the far left and the far right is all bending over as the air is being streamed into this supercell thunderstorm. And it just so happened to be at sunset too. So we were able to get a little bit of light on the left side of the updraft and then the colors underneath there uh, with the streaks of rain and hail back in that, that spot that we call the clear spot, the clear slot. And then the, uh, the kind of that, that backward C shape or mothership look to the supercell. Um, oh man, yeah, I just love it. I could, I could, I could go through 200, photo, 200 photos on here if, if, uh, if you all would let me, but that's, <laughs> that's the end of that one. And uh, I'll shut that back down. Amazing. Just amazing photos, Roger. Thank you. Oh, so thank you. If, if you still have time, perhaps we can take a few questions. Sure, absolutely. So please unmute yourselves if you have a question you'd like to ask Roger. Hey, Roger. Uh, I've had uh, some uh, experience with uh, the lightning triggers and um, oh. anytime I've tried, I think I've missed about 75% uh, of the lightning strokes. Uh, how, how well do they work for you? That's, that's, that's about what they do. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't catch every stroke, that's for sure. And then a lot of times what they'll do is they'll discharge on an inner cloud flash. So, uh, and, there, and there's no way to fix that. But it's, a, but it's a lot easier and a lot more successful using a trigger than sitting there with a, with a, with a, uh, you know, a real strong ND filter and just keep clicking and clicking and clicking. Uh, but yeah, yeah, they, 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 aren't, they aren't perfect. Yeah, far from it, that's for sure. Uh, I had a question. Sure. The submission process, 
for a video, you get a good lightning picture. Uh, how do you normally go through the submission? And if your picture is accepted, do you receive a royalty for that? Do what? Then that run that bottom. You broke up a oh, little it, bit. Yeah, you, you get a good shot. It, you want to submit it for, I guess, for media play. Uh -huh. uh, what's the submission process like? And do you receive a royalty? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you never license it exclusive uh, perpetually. Uh, you, you generally license it for a one time usage. And then if you if you license it like that, then you get a one time fee up front. Uh, but if you license it for them to use in perpetuity, uh, then you can write it in a contract that for everything that they use it for that you can that you can get uh, you know some kind of a royalty for. Uh, more so with video than than, uh, than than for photos, but yeah, I mean, I mean, even a lot of the news agencies around the country and around the world uh, are, are looking for photos as well as video. But you know, video shows action, and and uh, action is what news companies want more more than anything. Roger, um, the right. last picture that you showed, the very last one with the, the wide dish or whatever. Uh -huh. Right spot in the center. Can you tell me how the light gets to that center spot? That is called a clear slot in a, in a supercell. And what happens is, you know, like I mentioned, every supercell thunderstorm has an updraft, which is the, the cumulus cloud that's bubbling up into the sky. And then it has a downdraft, which is the area where the rain and the hail falls. But because the supercell is rotating so much, some of that rain and hail gets wrapped around to the back of the storm and since that air is, is heavier and colder than the air is around it, that air will sink to the ground and it parts the sky. So that, that thunderstorm updraft will get the appearance of a spaceship, but in reality, it kind of looks like a backward, shape, a backward shaped C. And so right in the middle of the back of that, there's no cloud material. So the light is hitting the clouds above it and reflecting down into the into the uh, the clear slot below it, and and you get that kind of yellowish or orangish colors that that come through there. It's just just beautiful. It's just a, amazing to photograph. There's some, sometimes I swear I want to go out for a whole year and not take a camera with me and just stand there and watch. <laughs> I know that'll never happen because I love to take <laughs> the pictures too. But say with Karen, but oh, I get it. Sometimes it's just so much fun to put the camera down and just look up in amazement of what these storms look like. Thank you. No, How welcome. close do you get to the storm, to the tornado? It depends on the situation. Uh, like I said, Karen will generally stay further back for photography tours uh, to, to get the whole storm structure. So you can see the, old, the structure of the supercell. And then once a tornado uh, touches down, then she'll get in closer. Uh, typically for good photography for supercell storms, if you can manage to get a, a good wide angle lens, you know, you know, if you're a full frame guy and you have something that's like a 14 millimeter, 11 millimeter, uh, hell, even a little cheapy eight millimeter that'll give you a, a kind of fisheye effect will still give you a, a nice picture if you like the fisheye look. Uh, but uh, usually five to 10 miles away. Uh, so you can see the structure. But when the tornado occurs, it, again, it depends on what your what your goal is. Well, I have you want to get I, the debris raining down in that. How close do you get? Uh, like like some of those pictures that you saw, uh, you can get within a half a mile and still keep yourself safe enough where you're not going to have debris falling on you. Uh, but it, again, it depends on how violent the tornado is. Really weak tornado, you can get right up next to. You can get within 100, 150 yards. Uh, but the stronger tornadoes, especially when they've hit something and have debris flying in the air, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the dangerous part. You know, as the old saying goes, the danger is not the fact that the wind is blowing it's what's blowing in the wind because <laughs> you get you get hit with a with a board that's flying at 150 miles an hour you're not gonna you're not gonna fare very well you know but if there's no debris then then obviously you can get up closer to it but so but do you, for, you have I'm a sorry. navigator with you or watching the radar yeah. in that we absolutely do yeah I, I'm, I'm always in the navigator seat uh, in, in my tours, and then Karen's always in a navigator seat in her tours, and then we have somebody else who's doing the driving. Uh, that's that uh, that is a, is a very like I said, we don't have anybody driving for us that doesn't have buku experience, and uh, I, I have a lot of folks who are, are firemen or police officers that that uh, that, are, that drive for me, and, and they've also been storm chasers for a long time. But all of our vans are rigged up so that we have Wi-Fi in there all the time. 
and we have a laptop set up tapped into the Wi-Fi, uh, so we can get constantly look at data, look at Doppler radar. You know, sometimes you have to refine your target, and you you know maybe you're heading toward one particular place, but as the but as the day starts to unfold, it looks like another place may be a little better than that one. So so that data tells us we can go to some other place different, uh, or again we have GPS with Doppler radar over the top of it so that we always know where we are in relation to the storm and, and what the road network is and whether it's paved or whether it's gravel or, or not even an unimproved road, like you're driving through some farmer's field and, and on, on a rut, you know, a pair of ruts or whatever, you don't want to do that, obviously. But uh, yeah, the, the, the vans have all of that equipment in there uh, all the time monitoring everything. So how often did, have you ever had anything like the El Reno tornado that started changing direction and oh yeah yeah that that was a actually the 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 chasers that got killed there tim samaris paul samaris and carl young uh tim is my tim was our neighbor and uh we we ran the uh, national storm chaser convention here in denver for 20 years together and uh we spent many times over at his place and he's been over to our place many times and uh, he was actually one of he tim was actually a guide for us for a couple of years on our tours uh, but uh, yeah, that was a really unfortunate incident. And when you have a when you have a major major tornado like that one, that was a 2.6 mile wide uh, tornado that originally got rated F5 and downgraded to F3 because of the damage. It just didn't hit a lot of structures. Uh, but when you have a very large tornado like that, that that's that covers about half of the size of the updraft. And when that tornado when that, you know, we were talking about real uh, rear flank downdraft winds that are wrapping around that circulation. When that wraps around the tornado, it takes that portion of the storm and occludes it from the rest of it. And when that happens, the tornado will typically turn from an easterly motion and go straight north and accelerate. And unfortunately, Tim, Paul, and Carl were on the north side of that tornado trying to get in the position to set their probes because they had probes that they put in front of the tornado to get, to get weather readings. And that tornado turned and went straight north right into them at 60 miles an hour. They didn't have a chance. There, there was no, no chance to get away from them. So we don't do that. We, we don't get in a position like that. We give ourselves enough, enough space. Uh, you got to respect nature and, and, and you don't put yourself in a position that you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole key. All right, thanks. That was a great presentation. Oh, you bet. So the tornadoes, I'm guessing, Roger, are following the normal weather patterns we see kind of west to east or that general direction, right? But then, like you're saying, other things can happen that could shift it. And that's the point you're making, correct? Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, a typical supercell thunderstorm travels north from southeast to, or some, excuse me, southwest to northeast. And as it starts rotating, they will always make a little bit of a right turn and move more easterly. And a tornado will follow the same path because it's within that area of rotating updraft that you get the tornado. What makes a tornado look like it changes, it changes its path. If this bottle does an updraft of a, of a supercell and it's spinning, if my tornado forms on the periphery of it, it'll make the appearance like it's rotating around it and, and going in different directions. In reality, it's not because the whole updraft is moving one way, but the tornado underneath it is rotating around it. And it almost looks like a, like a swirly pattern as it, as it goes, but it gotcha. really, it really doesn't change directions. Not very often. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I've got to come back. I was surprised when you said an ND filter might be used and I'm guessing that's purely for lightning, just to extend your purely time to get lightning. Is that right? Yeah. Well, some people like to use an ND filter when you have a bright cloud, uh, a bright white cloud. It'll help dull it a little bit. I, I don't personally. Uh, and when I when I'm shooting daylight lightning, uh, oh, Karen uses an ND filter for that with a lightning trigger to slow the shutter down a little bit, and maybe get you a little more success. Yeah. Uh, I like to use a circular polarizer. Uh, so I can dial it in and get the contrast that I want to where the lightning is and, and, uh, and use it that way. And that'll also slow down your, your shutter a bit. When you're using a lightning trigger for daylight, for daylight lightning photography, you want to try to get to about a one eighth to one quarter second shutter speed. If, you're, if, you, if you can't and you have no filters, 
you know, you're maybe, you're maybe looking at one, two fifty at their one five hundreds. And that's when the lightning triggers get a miss a lot because it's, it's too fast. And because uh, because what happens is the, is the lightning trigger detects the downward stroke. And by the time that your shutter lag occurs, I mean, a lot of cameras only have like a, you know, 18 thousandths or 20 or, you know, 20 thousandths of a lag which, uh, of, of, of shutter speed. But it's what it, well, what it does is it, it detects the original bolt heading down, but it won't catch the bolt when it trips your shutter unless you get a return stroke to the cloud. Yeah. So when you get that one strong bolt that hits the ground, it won't catch it because there's no return stroke. You got to have, those are called positive strikes. When you get a negative lightning bolt, it pulses. It pulses multiple times. And when it, even though what you can see, it looks like it's only going down, it's actually going down up, down up, down up, down up. And your lightning trigger will catch those almost every time. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Roger? So what is the most tornado-y month in the United States, Roger? May. May, okay. Okay. May is the most tornado we months, and it's also the month when the most storm chasers are out there on a storm. Gotcha. And, uh, I, you know, you may get on a, if there's one or two storms in a particular area, you may have 500 cars lined up along a sideway, or along a highway trying to take a picture. Yeah. And I hate chasing in May <laughs> because that's when all the storm chasers take their vacations. Uh, my favorite month to chase of the year is June. June, you get less uh, uh, less storm chasers out. There's a lot less traffic. Storms are moving slower because the jet stream is starting to retreat toward its northern uh, position up in the northern tier. So the winds are a little bit weaker. Uh, so storms are slower moving. You get almost as many tornadoes. And the nice thing is you're also in the high plains and the central and northern plains. And there's less pollution in the air and much, much better visibility. So... If I had to, somebody asked me, if, if, you know, if I could only chase one month a year, when would it be? No question. It would be June. Interesting. Last chance for questions. Anybody else have anything else they want to know about weather in general? We have an expert here. <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite clouds for sunset? Lenticulars. Lenticulars, ah. Yeah, we, we get standing lenticulars over the front range all the time. Otherwise, high cirrus. High, high right. cirrus clouds. We get, we get we those get pink red colors red. and things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, Roger? I sure can. I just wanted to say hi. Chris Coffey, I was with you in 2011 and 2012. Yeah, see and, how you do it. But you skipped over the part about eating gas station pizza. It's required <laughs> on the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, all the wonderful gas station food trying to hurry up and get from one place to another. We yeah. like some of them. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's one thing. There's you, you don't get a lot of a fine cuisine when you're out chasing sport. That's for sure. <laughs> Probably whatever you can get is what you're happy with, right? And Not there for food. food. <laughs> okay last chance for questions for roger anybody well on behalf of the cuyahoga valley photographic society we want to thank you again just an absolute uh, fountain of knowledge and wisdom about storms and weather and how to photograph these severe features and also try and stay safe so thank you so much for your time to spend with us we greatly appreciate it and for those who caught, I, I saw different people logging at different times, probably when you could get from work or whatever, this will be available on YouTube on our CVPS uh, uh, channel. So thank you all. We'll look forward to severe weather as long as we stay safe in the upcoming months. So have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care.